Financial advisors help Australians live better lives. And we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. Zurich is the proud partner supporting this episode. As one of Australia's largest life insurers, Zurich encourages the promotion of positive conversations leading to a more sustainable future for life insurance. Committed to championing financial advice through education and research-led market insights. Well, for my very first podcast, I thought who better than the man handing over the spiritual XY podcast baton, Mr. Fraser Jack. What is clear from our chat is that the man has seen the industry from so very many angles. He's heard so many stories of success and endurance, and he has some big plans to shake things up for us for the better. And I'm here to learn all about it. Also, please enjoy me mucking up the intro. I will get better. I hope. And now we have a very, very familiar voice for those of you that have been listening to the XY podcast for a long time. And that is no other than the Fraser Jack. Wow, hello, I should, Fraser. Hello, I should change my name to no other than. That no other cool. than the wonderful All Fraser right. Jack. Yeah, great. Missed that. Missed what that a lovely way. introduction. Hello. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to have you as my first podcast guest as we do a bit of a changing of the guards. I felt like it was absolutely essential to have you. Wow, well, fantastic. And, and the irony of all this is when I first started podcasting back in, I don't know, uh, uh, 2017, I think it was, you were my first guest on the, on the podcast. What a funny little circle it's been. Well, thank you. And today I am very excited to sort of talk about what we're doing, both in terms of the podcast, but also you more broadly. And then we're going to wrap up with some questions about, you know, Fraser, outside of XY Advisor, just Fraser, which I'm very delighted and excited to do. So, as you know, I'm taking over the Thursday podcast. Congratulations. Because, um, thank you. I'm excited and slightly terrified because I feel like I have very big shoes to fill. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's nerve-wracking because, you know, people are giving up their time and I feel like I've got quite a big job to make sure that I extract as much amazing insights and info to deliver to this lovely community that we have. And I'm, I'm feeling the weight of responsibility <laughs> firmly on my shoulders. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's too, it's too much responsibility. I think the community would be pretty much looking forward to hearing from you. Woohoo! So, should we talk about what we're going to do? Yes, let's do it. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about it because obviously uh, the, uh, the XY podcast has, has grown over the years. We've got Monday uh, morning uh, market updates brought to you by Milford. We've got uh, Benny Nash taking over on the Tuesday. Uh, we're doing a little bit of um, uh, deep dive content into particular topics on Wednesdays, which aren't every Wednesday, but they come out fairly regularly, which you'll still hear me on. Uh, and of course, now we've got uh, Jess doing the Thursday podcast. Yes. And so because now we've got um, a lot more diversity in terms of who's delivering these podcasts, Clay sort of sent me a big task and said, do whatever you like, which I felt like was too too broad <laughs> for my brain. And so I sat and thought about, you know, what, what would I like to use this platform or this opportunity to deliver? And so I thought about it in a couple of different ways. We've obviously been through a pretty intense few years. Do we not say that, though, every time? Every time it just sort of ratchets up. I feel like for the last 14 years of, that I've been in the industry, <laughs> I think we've just been constantly saying that, which just tells me the temperature has been rising and rising and rising. But, yeah, given it's been such an intense few years, I've thought about how do we live a great life? And I want to really go into it in a couple of different ways. So I want to talk about how we can look after ourselves as people because I think we really need to and we need to put our oxygen mask on first and sometimes we're not good at that, me included. Um, I want to think about how can we help our clients or our members live really great lives and then I want to talk about how can we build better businesses and I feel like one without the other is no good and so I want to get quite deep on really exploring what I think is going to be quite gritty conversations because as you might know about me, Fraze, I'll go anywhere and I'll go deep. 
<laughs> Very good. And I, you're absolutely right about this this concept of it has been a crazy few years, but it's always been a crazy few years for the last twenty odd mm. years that I've been in it. So, uh, and, and let's just let's just imagine that's going to be business as usual moving forward. This and so this this concept and this idea about focusing on. Um, you know, living a great life, uh, your personal self and understanding how that then uh, works into your business life and, and how both your, you as a human being and you as a business both operate. So I think it's, it's, not, it's content that's both relevant now but ongoing into the future. And, you know, selfishly I think why I'm doing this is because I don't know the answer. M- maybe no one knows the answer but I have always put one at the top sort of pyramid and, and I don't think it should be a pyramid because it then means the others fall behind. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the uh, the Venn diagram, isn't it? They both need to be, they both need to have some sort of focus and uh, and it's about yeah, making sure. So I, I think it's a great topic, I think it's a great idea and um, I'm really looking forward to listening to the episodes. Woohoo. Okay, enough about what I'm going to be doing. Um I am really keen to talk through you because one of the beautiful ironies is that you have been a regular voice in the XY community, but I actually think that because you are very good at extracting insights from other people, we don't really get the opportunity to sort of ask you a lot of those questions. And so I'd love to sort of, I guess, get you to go back in time and tell us more about, you know, what what is your story? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my story is um, I was I was actually born and brought up in New Zealand, and so sometimes you'll hear that through as a funny little accent that uh, tends to come through every now and then in a, in a word. Although I think most people in New Zealand think I've got an Australian accent. So um, I, th- you know, I was brought up there, but uh, my first uh, my first career was being a chef. So you know, being creative, I love the creativity of of cooking and. Um, and you know producing something and doing everything you can to, and it was always you know the you know if you've ever watched MasterChef it's all about you know the getting into the interest you know down into the detail and looking at what you can do that's slightly different and amazing and um mm. and of course back then I thought it was always a, all about the food and 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 now I have a different opinion I think it's all about the uh the experience that people have the the client experience that goes on it's not necessarily just about the the uh the one little part of uh, going out to eat so uh, so from that, um, you know, natural, uh, you know, nat- natural progression straight into being a financial advisor, of course, as you of do. Course. But that really led the way that I was a self-employed chef working in um, all sorts of places around in, in Sydney doing uh, what that was called chefs on the run at the time. Um, and I was a contract chef and I worked in a lot of hotels and industries and I'd loved um, you know, uh, the whole world of, you know, finance and, you know, I had all my sure insurances in place and uh, I was talking to people all the time about, you know, purchasing and um, stocks and shares and, and so it was really, really easy to give financial advice as a chef. There was just, you know, in passing <laughs> conversation, you could tell people what they should be doing and their savings plans and all these sorts of things. Super easy. I imagine it's pretty easy for Uber drivers these days as well. Um, mm. And then, uh, yeah, so then I went back and studied and became a financial advisor and was given an opportunity to opened my own business from scratch, having never worked in the profession before. Um, and back in those days, it was here as a telephone. Um, here is some, if it was before financial services reform kicked in. So it was um, it was the old customer information brochures, brochures, which is the PDS that you know today. And uh, it was imagined, it was a, a little bit of um, training on what was in them and how the policies responded and, and how superannuation worked. And there, go out and therefore just go out and re a, you know, invent your own wheel and, and talk to people or ring people and have conversations. So it was a bit of a school of hard knocks starting from zero clients and, and no real system. So hang on. Firstly, I didn't know you were a chef. I feel like that is a great skill just to have in life. Uh, are you telling me that you were crazy enough to transition from being a chef, giving part-time advice in the kitchen, to literally going into your own business, presumably alone with no clients? And we're talking 2001, 2002. You're wild. What was that like? Tell me about those early years. Uh, it was it was interesting. Uh, it wasn't something I'd ever done before, so it was certainly a big uh, big challenge. And there was, uh, you know, I think there was plenty of obstacles in the way, but you just keep pushing through because you know you knew that uh, the you know you had belief in in the what advice did for people and and how it worked. Mm-hmm. And so um, yeah, you just yeah, that, that's all you focus on the fact that you knew this thing. Um, that other people should know about it, and uh, and so just like um, you know, doing a podcast or whatever it might be, you you open your mouth and you spoke about it. I'm so amazed because I thought I was completely insane having jumped out of sort of the BDM side of things into starting an advice business in 2017. 
But oh, don't, I don't get me imagine. wrong. Don't get me wrong. You are insane. No, no, I'm only kidding. No, but you do. You do <laughs> you have to be. Will. You do have to be slightly uh, insane and, and and back yourself in a, in a way, I guess. Um, okay, so tell me. So then you built a business from nothing, from scratch, and then what happened? Yeah, bought a, I built a business from scratch. Uh, I was working with another um, planner who um, actually uh, passed away, so I ended up purchasing mm. um, that uh, that business as well. Um, so both studying my own and purchasing a, a book and put those two together and, and ran that business for, uh, I want to say, about 13 years. Um, and then uh, I was doing a lot of work with the Association of Financial Advisors. I was on the board there and I was um, sort of got to the point where I was ready for a little bit of uh, change in my life. So, um, you know, we, it wasn't enough constant ongoing change um, and essentially looked at thinking to myself, you know, I'm going to sell this or exit this business and um uh, and do something slightly different. But obviously I was looking around and I wanted to do something within the financial services uh, sector itself. And my passion was really around the technology and trying to um, simplify technology. And, and you know, I, I felt that the advice process, uh, well, many of us felt this, that the advice process wasn't as, as effective and efficient as it could have been when the use of technology. So that was sort of where my passion lay and I, and I sold and exited the business. Uh, from there, I went on it and worked for a uh, worked with a licensee uh, for twelve months, um, and really got to understand the the pains and uh, the pains and the 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 wins and the the idea of what goes on within the licensee land, and 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 um, you know from understanding how uh, AFSLs work and and what their their main purpose is and what their journey is like. Um, and then from there, I've been I spent three years in advice technology and regulate reg tech and advice tech and for the last 12 months or so I've just really been consulting in that space um, talking to businesses about what they can do in both goals-based advice and technology and um, and uh, yeah working obviously on the podcast still love love podcasting mm-hmm. uh, it's not necessarily a career running a podcast or being a host of a podcast it's more of a I, I love the saying that people do podcasts that people don't do podcasts uh, for the money, uh, they do it to make a difference. So I think uh, that's that's what most podcasters are at. Um, what do you mean? This is my new career trajectory. <laughs> this is it for me. What are you talking? <laughs> a free free podcast, excellent. So uh, so there you go. So it's um uh so that that was podcasting, and then uh, yeah. So now I'm, I'm I'm working on a few interesting projects, consulting, and um uh, and got some some future uh, ideas that I want to I want to bring out. So. Amazing. And what's so interesting is, you know, normally consultants haven't sat on all of the sides and and just listening to you, having thought I knew what it was like to be an advisor, now now being one, I know that I had no idea what it was like to be an advisor. And so that breadth of knowledge is is quite rare. Uh, Can we though, because it's so funny, I've known you for so long and I'm learning so much, which is fascinating. Can I go and, can we go back for a sec? I want to ask you something, but it's a bit it's a bit much. So you just tell me if you want me to back off and I can absolutely back off. So you bought a book from a business, was it a business partner who died? Uh, it was, um, so it was a colleague. Yeah. So somebody in the same licensee uh, that was working out of the same office. We don't talk about this stuff enough because it's not nice, but we all know that in our world, sometimes we have to have pretty interesting charts. And so given that we have, let's call it an aging advice population, I think we should we should talk about this if you don't mind. Um, did you guys have a succession plan? Was this always the plan? What was that like for you? I'd imagine that would have been wildly traumatic, and you would have ha- had to comfort clients that weren't yours at the same time as console staff and yourself. Like, what was that like, phrase? Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about succession planning, we talk about um, the concept of retirement. Obviously, mm. is the first mm. area somebody wants to retire or step back from their their position or their role, um, which is great. You know, it's a great way to do it because you've you know, that you've got that continuity of, you know, the transition and the handover and all those sorts of things. And, um, and there is, you know, um, there's always a reason or a purpose, you know, why, why that's happening. Um, there could be yeah. a transition out where somebody says their purpose is to get out of the profession and, and not do that anymore. Um, but then there's also got the, the third area of that is when somebody's passing away. And that can be either a transition period because, uh, in my particular circumstances, um, uh, the person who I purchased the business from got cancer, got sick, and spent you know twelve months fighting the disease, and then and then um, um, lost his battle. So it mm-hmm. was plenty of conversations that took place over a period of time that 
would be, okay. this is what happens, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, and then there's the other the other end of that spectrum, if you like, where somebody unexpectedly passes away and then all of a sudden mm. they either may or may not have a plan in place. And there's no reason why adv- advisors can't have that conversation up front now that says, look, let's put something, let's, let's just do an agreement in place that if something happens to you um, or something happens to me that you'll, you know, purchase my my business for mm. this uh, this valuation methodology. So it's not a, a figure, it's just based on we're going to do it as a um, such and such times blah, whether it's EBIT mm. or, or renewal. I mean, um, we're not talking about business valuation specifically in this one, but um, mm. and then uh, and then there's the uh, then you see succession plans in place where if you've got a larger business, then it could well be you do shareholder buyout or whatever it might be. Just has have a plan in place if something unexpectedly happens to one of the directors, um, and then there's the the next step you can go where you can actually say you know what well our advice would be to put some death cover in place for this person's as they succeed and you have a buy sell agreement and all those sorts of things right so you know it's yeah. very good it's interesting the old plumber with the, with the leaky tap you know to say how many financial advisors out there don't have their own succession plan in place but yet they talk about key person succession in their business i was literally just thinking so so when we started the business we sat down and we did it because it's something that i had spent a lot of time talking about when I was inside an insurance company. And, you know, the boys thought I was sort of slightly mad because the business was worth nothing. We had a total of zero clients. But I was like, no, we need, we, we need this. If something really terrible happens, you know, it's 29. Um, ever the optimist, if something terrible happens, we need to sort this out. And, yeah, we got um, the insurance cover and stuff in place. But I think when you're younger, it's just one of those conversations where you're like, oh, yeah, I'll do it later when – there's a trigger event, but of course we know that that's not always possible. So, and as um, you know, starting a business, there's a million other things to do that can easily take priority. They're like, Jess, we need clients, and you want to figure out a terms of sheet and a buy sell agreement. I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> um, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So you had time to transition. I, I actually just didn't know that, and so I, I just wanted to learn a bit more about that. But thank you, and I can imagine that would have been a very testing time, and leadership would have been front and center a yeah. lot. So, you're working on projects. What can we expect from you over, you know, the course of 2022 and beyond? Yeah, it's um, there's there's a lot of exciting stuff that I'm working on, and I've, t- I've tended to choose projects that um, excited me, which is, I guess, leans into that, you know, what's a great life look like uh, theme of your podcast. Um, and the, and and the first one is really around um, a project that I was passionate about since day dot, uh, which is around. Um, uh, efficiency and, and effectiveness in the process, and obviously one of the um, the bottlenecks that hold up a lot of advisors in this space is the is the concept of the statement of advice. And so, I've been doing some work with the FPA um, and ASIC on producing uh, what what was affectionately known as video statements of advice um, to replace paper statements of advice or, or PDF versions of of uh, advice and. And so, which is which sounds like a very big project, but it's actually been a project that uh, started off with the concept that without changing any legislation or, or without changing any existing regulatory guidance uh, and without introducing any new software that doesn't yet already exist in an advisor's lifespan um, or that they actually know how to use, is it possible to produce a video SOA? And when I say video SOA, everybody jumps to the concept of, and because we've had 20 years of training in this, here is a here is a one that we've prepared earlier. Go away and watch or read that, and then come back and we'll have the conversation about it. Uh, and so naturally, we produce this paper document, we send it to the client, or it might be, or present it to the client, or work through it with the client. But this is about going. No, let's actually provide the advice live in the meeting and just have all the information lined up. So um, sticking to a fairly strict agenda. Let's start with, um, you know, you, you know, making sure you can record. We've got a we've got a slide or a piece of the agenda that says this is a statement of advice using the word statement of advice because that's a regulatory requirement, and it's for mm-hmm. you, Jess, and it's from me, Fraser, or whatever the the advice relationship is. And this is our advice provider, AFSL number, etc. Then you go through that would say okay to record, and um, you know this is where our current position is, and this is the scope, and this is the strategy we're going to implement, and this is the uh, products we're going to need to effectively make the strategy work, and these are all the fees and and ways we get you know our biases and the way we we charge and the way we get paid, and if there's any commission on those, it's how it works and the numbers and the percentages, and then if there's any products being replaced, we go through that. So it's about going through this the same advice in the same order you currently do, but instead of 
having it written in a document, you screen share. So you're saying, okay, here is my, um, you know, insert software providers um, <laughs> uh, page here, and right. I can show you, and you can see because I'm I'm screen sharing, whether you're in person or an online meeting, you can see that that's you, that's your details, that's what you said, that was your, you know, health status, that was these are your super fund amounts, these are all the things that we discussed that you told me, and and that's all accurate, and you can obviously do the inaccurate um, information warning at that time. But you can just say these things. You don't actually have to have them written down. You just have a, an agenda that you're following along. Mm. And um, share screens, uh, go back to the agenda, go to the research, go back to the agenda, go to a mud map that shows the strategy, go back to the agenda, go back, you know, like, and you can just have different tabs open. And you record that conversation the same way as you're recording our conversation right now. Um, mm-hmm. And that recording or record of the advice being provided is your is your recorded of you, your record of you stating the advice to me, your statement of advice. Praise. We need this. <laughs> so this. We need this. <laughs> we need this so badly because how many of our clients truly read the whole thing in its current version? How many of them actually get it? And and is it documented? You know, I've started recording um, my client meetings over the last sort of twelve months. For, for internal purposes and file noting, et cetera. But I think to myself, gosh, if there's ever a dispute, surely there's no better thing than a, than a recording of the actual discussion that was had. And I also just think it gives the, the person time to ask questions live and make sure that they understand it. So yeah. you might not be in a position where you can answer this, but when shall we expect said <laughs> I think, uh, look, I think this is coming out. Uh, it's, it's a March project um, to be presented uh, from the from the Financial Planning Association. So it'll be on their website from about March. I uh, can't give you the exact date, but um, if, it, no. if, it's a, um, if you're listening to this episode past March, then go back and have a look for it. Um, yeah. I've been in corporate for a long time. And the great thing that we used to do is we'd give months, but not years. Are you talking about March 2022? <laughs> I'm talking about March 2022, yes. Oh, they're doing that is yeah. amazing, and then obviously it has to go through a process where AFSLs decide whether they're comfortable with it and all of the things. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so it's looking at the legislation, it's looking at the the legal requirements. Then there's obviously this decision is, is up to AFSLs. Some some uh, AFSLs I've spoken to are pretty keen on it. They understand. Um, obviously, if it's self licensed, there's you know compliance. Uh, lawyers and those things to get passed, but I think most of them also agree that you know having a recording, as you just said, of the of the file is is pretty um, is pretty good evidence of the conversation. Plus, also you can actually um, it's I think it's a great way of demonstrating um, understanding or informed consent. So I could say to you, Jess, uh, I've just explained that to you. What if you would explain it back to me in your words? How would you explain it, and then allow you mm. to explain it back and me to think about what you're saying and go, yeah, I think you've got it, or you don't, um, and that's pretty critical for you know um, what what was the um, the old FCA regulations, but you know the the code of conduct around informed consent and understanding the mm. information, not just being disclosed, um, and yeah, to be able to go back and then for them to be able to have a copy of that video to watch the full interview, you know, like um, I know you record for internal purposes, but it, this is about saying then I'm going to provide this video back to you, the whole conversation, mm. no editing or cutting. So if you're chatting about, you know, you know, their daughter's wedding or whatever it might be, just keep, keep the conversation going about that. You know, it's just, um, mm. that's all part of the advice process. Um, so it's, you know, they can be a little slightly longer, but, uh, but you give that client a copy and if they even want to go back and re-listen to explaining that, you know, strategy or the, the product's, back to you, then it's in their own words. Mm, just do your hair nice so that it looks good for later. Yeah, well, let, let, that's another thing too. If you let them know they're being recorded, they will they'll probably will do their hair nice. Uh, what a game changer for the industry this could be. That's a phenomenal contribution phrase to how we deliver advice in Australia, both from an advisor lens, a back office lens, but a client lens. That, that's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's what's really, really um, proud of being able to do that work and, 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 you know, bring that to, to the front because I do actually think it can be a game changer in the way that advice is delivered and, uh, in both that understanding piece, uh, that efficiency piece and effectiveness piece. Um, there was client research done along the way as part of this project and, and, you know, the clients have all, um, said, um, you know, that, that's a fantastic idea. Some people still want the written document, which is fine. You can just, 
still say, well, we can still produce the written document. It costs us X, so we just pass that charge on. Um, mm. uh, you know, for us to get a, a, a power planner to create that document, it would cost blah, blah, blah. Would you like us to get a copy to you? You know, otherwise we don't really need to have one for our file, but that's for you. Um, there's there's yeah, there's all sorts that can be done in that space, and I think it's um, it, it is a bit of a game changer. And you know, I, I'm, it's certainly a, it's certainly a bit of a passion project as well as a uh, as well as a consulting project. That's for sure. My brain is going absolutely berserk in you know internally trying to figure out like I've immediately gone to how would we do this? How would we implement this? What would we show our members? What would we not show our members? You know, if this comes off and and licensees say yes, which as you've rightly said, a lot of them are very comfortable with it. I think actually this gives so many advice. I mean, SOA generation is my biggest pain point inside our business, both from a time perspective for me, but also, um, a, you know, just the the sheer cost to produce it is making advice more and more expensive. And frankly, I produced this document that I think looks beautiful because we've added in all these nice pictures to keep people awake. But I just have to take members through it. And I honestly think to myself, they're not going to read. They're not going to read this. I know that they're not going to read this. So, um, you know, I think if this does happen, anyone who's giving advice is probably going to spend quite a bit of time reinvigorating their process to adapt. We've all adapted to online and that we've, we've been shown that our clients can adapt to online when they're forced to as well. I think this is the perfect time to be yep. releasing or launching something like that. So yep. I just want to say if this comes off in the way that you're saying it, a huge thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. I, like the cost thing, you mentioned the cost thing there, and I, I agree with that. Like to me, there's a like there's a value chain in our businesses that at at one end of the chain is the shareholder, and the other end of the chain is the client. And when it comes to cost, any inefficiency is either borne by the shareholder or the client. Uh, there's no one in the middle of the process or the or the value mm. chain that picks up the cost except for the the shareholder or the client. So I think this is um going to relieve a little bit of cost from the advice point of view, and hopefully it can reduce some of the cost for the client. So exciting. Can't wait. Please keep me updated. Uh, but that's not all you're working on this year. You've got some other exciting projects that you're up to. No, I think uh, those people that know me um, understand, understand that I normally work on you know, four or five different projects at once. But uh, <laughs> the uh, the two big ones for me this year is obviously um, getting the the SOA project out and, you know, helping practices implement it or he- helping licensees get their heads around it because there's a massive mind, uh, you know, mind shift that has to take place when you've had 20 years of conditioning um, since financial services reform came in, uh, on this is a statement of advice. This is how we do it. You know, we had uh, the modern technology back in the day was Microsoft Word, and so that was what we had. You know, we we took on and we we created, um, you know, big these big Word documents, and and that's what we've been doing ever since. So there's a huge mind mindset shift that has to take place. Um, and the other thing that I'm doing is helping advisors set their practices up um, to more securely look after their client data. I, I remember, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a cyber, it's going to be called the Cyber Collective and, and it's coming out again around uh, March 2022. And I, I think back to the days when we had paper files and we used to lock those files in filing cabinets and then you'd lock the office mm. door and there was a double lock between, the, you know, clients' personal um, financial and medical data because let's face it, if you do a personal statement, you're holding on to both. Then... Mm. Um, which is a really sought after thing, but now, nowadays we, we've got it all online, uh, and anybody, um, uh, any any hacker from around the world can basically break into our system and, and steal our clients' confidential and private data. So the location thing is not a problem for them. Uh, the the level of security is not really a problem for them, and and I think it's a huge risk to a lot of businesses. So just helping advisors to be able to shore up that side of their business. There's, there's never going to be a perfect solution when it comes to cyber hackers and but uh, but it's certainly a whole lot of steps and as asset would say reasonable steps you could take um to sec- securing that uh, that data online yeah it is something that keeps me awake at night sometimes you know sometimes it's really easy to spot and then you hear stories about how sophisticated and complicated some of these sort of hacks are and you just for me i just worry i just think god it's just one you're one click away potentially from doing something that could be really detrimental, not only to releasing data, but to losing trust and credibility. And it's very scary. Yeah, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? One click away, it could be you or one click from any of your staff as well. So it's it's one of those scenarios that um, 
you know, uh, losing losing your client data is is bad because obviously most advisors are in this in this business to help people, so they're just they're wanting to be you know help helping uh, their clients, and and you're one click away from losing that. But also, as you mentioned, the trust factor. Um, there's the the loss of reputation and possibly the loss of business valuation as well. Yeah, thank you. I'm quietly um, increasing my temperature here as I'm sitting here just thinking <laughs> about that. Yeah. I'll give <laughs> yeah. I'll give you the good news yeah. on the SOA, and then I'll give you the bad. I'll see about the bad news. Yeah, we should have done it the other way around. Never mind. Um, <laughs> amazing, and we wish you all the very best. They sound like really exciting projects, and as I said, yeah. they sound like things that are going to have a big big impact on our community. So a, yep. a giant thank you. Um, given that you've been doing the podcast for a while. And you have such a breadth of people that you've spoken to and topics and insights that you've covered. I sort of wanted to go quite broad and talk to you about, you know, what have you seen to be the best changes or what are you seeing as like the most exciting pieces of the industry from the people that you've interviewed thus far? Yeah, I think I think the big thing um, to me over, I don't know, what have we got now, for, for nearly five years um, is – the, the evolution from just, um, you know, about providing advice to um, different business models, different people looking at different industries. I, I know you guys did this when you started out. You went, what are other, what are other professions or industries do in their business that, that and um, that's, that, that game changes? So, uh, you know, things like um, introducing or really focusing on your member first or, or, or client experience. Um, looking at uh, you know the, that wellness and, and balancing, there's been a lot of conversations around um, the amount of stress and, and um, uh, you know how people are coping with stress around me- mental flexibility. Um, I, I really enjoy that part of the conversations. Um, I enjoy conversations when I speak to people and I go, "Oh, you actually you take that concept from this industry and you've implemented it. And, oh, well, then that really works." Um, mm. uh, so any of those to me, it's always been around. Uh, you know, helpful hints. Uh, if it's if it's all good points, like it's always been around. Um, what, what's someone doing in the business that's just like, oh, it's a good point. Never really thought of that. And so, to me, when it comes to producing any type of content, it's around going. You know, make it make try and find some useful points and things that people are doing, and and bring that to the conversation. Um, and I always say that sometimes if there's no points, there's there's no point. <laughs> in the, in, mm. the, in the conversation, but I think uh, you know stories. Everybody likes hearing somebody else's story or what they're doing, uh, where they're where they're at. There's a lot of, I think there's always a lot of benchmarking that goes on. If, if you're siloed in a business and you're not really sure, then you you know the podcast and those sorts of things are great for that sort of. Oh, you're doing that too. Oh, you've had that same problem as I do. Oh, well, that's you know that's great. And then this is how you 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 came at that's a good idea. So often uh, some of the best parts of a podcast is not just about wins. It's about things that didn't go right, our obstacles mm. overcome, those sorts of things. So, yeah, there's been there's been plenty of conversations over over many years where I've just gone, wow, that's really cool. That's you know, that's a great way to to um to to run your business or do something that's different. So, yeah, anything that's sort of slightly different that puts the again puts the client first. Anything that's um that's uh, great for businesses and staff and um. I came up, I, I read a saying the other ages ago that I really loved and that was around teamwork and that, you know, teams are a group of people that trust each other, not people that work together. Um, and mm. so there's all sorts of things that you pick up along the way that I think when you're a host of a, of a podcast, you actually get to see this gold all the time because you're constantly talking to people about it and having those, those conversations with purpose because often when you're having conversations with, you know, you catch up with, I'll catch up with you. We'll say good day, have a, you know, chat, chat, but we don't go into the, the, you know, those deeper points like, you know, tell me about your history coming through or tell me about that moment in your life. Mm, it would probably be quite weird and somewhat interrogative if I went up to people who I haven't seen in a while and said, right, tell me yeah. your story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so in, so in a podcast, you have every excuse to do so. Yeah. Exactly. That's why I'm very excited because, you know, I'm a nosy, curious person. Um, it's so, you know, just listening to what you were saying around the wellness piece and the idea that people are picking up great concepts from other industries and inserting them or trying to figure out how to insert them into what they do. I just, you know, my immediate thought was, you know, how do we make space and time for this you know, innovative thinking and this deep learning about what other people are doing? Because often when we get busy, we're just so focused and siloed on you know, the work at hand. But yeah, I'm I'm delighted to hopefully keep that momentum going and, and learning more. But isn't it's not all rosy. And I think it would be remiss of us to not talk about some of the big challenges. And 
some of the, the tough stuff that's happening for our industry as well. You know, given that you, again, have spoken to so many people, what are you noticing as sort of the main pain points or challenges or frustrations that our lovely little community is facing? Yeah, I think the big one's always been uncertainty. Um, you know, it's not like we have, but look, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to love about what's right about the profession. And often sometimes we tend to focus on the negative parts because um, they're pressing. Um, but I'd say, you know, just that the idea that, you know, when, uh, when a profession is 20 years old and it has, has rules that have been very similar for 15 or 20 years, then there is some sort of certainty around what the future might look like. Um, and obviously we we've been through a lot of rapid change, which means, you know, we don't quite know how it's going to land. We know that, um, we know that some stuff will be right and some stuff will be wrong and need tweaking over the years. But in the meantime, it's, it's painful and it, it hurts and, um, it's inefficient or whatever it might be. Um, so look, yeah. I think that's, uh, that's probably a, a, one of the, the biggest pain points is around that inefficient, oh, sorry, around that just uncertainty of not knowing how it's all going to turn out. Um, and that, whether that's changes in products, you know, whether that's, you know, changes in the way you have to do business and additional work that you need to do and box ticking and all those sorts of things. Um, but it's, a, I, I guess all of those things come back to, um, and, and, and you'd know this with all the, the research you've done in the past, it's around attitude. It's around how you um, approach those from a mental flexibility point of view. Um, there's always going to be obstacles it's just whether you see it as an obstacle or whether you you know you see it as a, as a way to improve and 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 t- you know sometimes you have to you have to vent a little bit and then you can sit back and go right that's an obs- right now now I can actually sit back and um, I've done my I've done my little bit of venting so now I can go and work out how to get around it or move over it or build a bridge or or use it in as a positive. Mm, I was just thinking as you were talking about that. I just want to sort of say very loudly we're tough. You know, to work in the financial services industry today, irrespective of what your role is, you're tough. Like we've been put through a lot. And I don't think we often give ourselves enough credit because we're we're also part-time counsellor and, and marriage consultant and all these things. And, and, you know, sometimes we end a day and I feel quite drained and I don't think we spend enough time, given that there's all this regulatory complexity and economic uncertainty and all these sort of things that, you know, are thrown at us, this constant barrage, you know, I, I think it's important to acknowledge, irrespective of how you're feeling, because some days it does not feel good. Like you gotta you're we're tough to be in this industry and to be to be able to continue to get up every day and do what you do. I think inherently you've got to have a, a lot of determination and tenacity and and care. Yeah, absolutely. And purpose. I think it's um you know, you you mentioned that, you know, you, you're tough. Um it's not the only role that you know, advisors play, they're an advisor, but they also might be, a, you know, a partner or a husband or a wife or a mother or a mm. father or a brother or a sister or whatever it might be. Um, you've got all these other roles to play. And so, um, so you've got, uh, you've got things to juggle, but also I think, you know, you, there are a lot of obstacles, but it comes back down to that purpose driven um, ideal that, uh, you know, what, what are you, why are you there? You know, you're there to help people. You're there because you can mm. help people. So, you know, you feel the, the obligation and, and the need and the want and the desire to do so. Or you could be the uh, owner of a Lugotto like me who is constantly demanding attention and additional walks, and I hope she does not feature on future podcasts, but I suspect that she will. Of course she will. Oh, dear. So that's probably comes to my next point, which is the phrase, I am trying to solve this very big complex problem that is possibly unsolvable around how to live a great life. What do you think? What do you think are the key elements? I, I think the key elements are having purpose or direction. Uh, mm. I think the key elements are understanding what your own values are. So if you know and, and you then can think about what other things that you what drive you as a human being and understand what your values are. I think um, aligning your values with the people around you, whether that's in relationships or whether it's partnerships or business or clients or whatever it might be, um, then that would be you know a great start towards living a, ha- a happy, healthy life. And that is um, uh, very much around that values alignment. Um, it doesn't have to be necessarily your goals alignment or your all those sorts of things. You can still have different goals, but be aligned with values. Um, and then a lot of that rest of it comes back down to you know communication. I think as well, you can. It's very, it's very. It, some for people that communicate a lot, it's, it's probably a little bit easier than those that uh, bottle it up. Mm. Do you know what I've been grappling with lately? This idea that just because you're good at something doesn't mean you like it. And if you if you are a challenge oriented person, which I am it's actually very conflicting to go back and think, 
did I really like that thing or, or did I like it because I was good at it and I got praise and I overcame the challenge and I got accolades for it? It's a very confronting thought process that I'm currently grappling with. So there you go. Um, but I think you're right to your values piece. And we talk a lot about this every day. Like it should just drive everything. It should be at our center. And yet we spend almost no time actively and importantly sitting down and talking about it and understanding it and and noticing where there's conflicts both from a personal relationship perspective but if you've got a business partner or you've you know you work in a team like understanding what drives everyone so that you know we understand good behavior but we also understand behavior that maybe isn't perfect because we are alas imperfect beings absolutely absolutely <laughs> not you j- just me oh no we all are um, we all are so i have some rapid fire questions yes let's go let's do it I think I want to use these. We might iterate them. If, if you're listening to this and you think that's a terrible question, change it. Let me know because this is my first one. Or if you think you want me to ask extra questions, I'm all about it. But because I'm trying to tackle this from a holistic perspective, I thought I would sort of fire some potentially weird ones at you. So take a deep breath. Fire away. <laughs> what do you do to look after your mental health? Uh, sleep. And uh, so, so once, uh, you know, like it could just be making sure that you got lots of sleep, um, uh, sleep, uh, food, a little bit of gut health, um, a bit of mental flexibility, stop and, stopping and going backwards and forth a few times and looking at things from every different angle. Um, mm-hmm. As in, that's my opinion, but what, what could another opinion be or what could somebody else that we could they, be coming from? That often helps with um, uh, conflict and understanding and, 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 and forgiving. I have a saying that I don't like to be the victim. So um, if you if you you can't be you can't do the blame game or you can't um, you can't make it anything anybody else's fault. Otherwise, you're the victim. So you can't not be the victim without saying take, hard. taking on everything. What if you are the victim? What if you are the victim? What if <laughs> well, you just wanted someone to be saying it's no, it's okay? Then uh, then well you know then if you if you if you play that game then you're at, you're um, at effect of something other else is causing so the idea is if you Mm. wanted to have complete control then um then you just say oh that was my that was my thing i could probably got it done better or i could have recognized that sooner um everything's a journey so a little bit of that a little bit of a little bit of physical a little bit of mental but i think mental flexibility is a big part of that um and just taking the time out of whatever you're doing to to look at things from different angles and and be happy with stuff i think happiness is one of those things that um you know, you look at great life. I think happiness is one of those things that, you know, if you're watching too much news or getting too many, getting too deep into something, you're not going to be happy. And um, there's also that saying around happiness that um, if you just you can actually be happy with what you have rather than be happy with all the things you don't have or you know, unhappy about mm. things not not having stuff. So, yeah, was- you, you know, we look at comparative comparison artists with our clients, but there's a bucket load of it in our industry as well. Uh, fascinating that you answered one of the things I didn't expect you to answer when you said when I asked about mental health was gut health because there's so much research now that gut health plays a big part in mental health. Just quickly, what are you doing with gut health? I need to know. Oh, so it's just, um, it's just, uh, um, from a dietary point of view, I do intermittent eating. I don't eat in the mornings. I'll just eat in the afternoons, uh, and evenings. And I'm not too, you know, too serious about it all. I, I just try to eat, eat, uh, things that are good for your gut health and make, make them butcher and uh, do those things. And yeah, just, uh, just, I'm not saying it's. I'm not saying it's a. It's something that I. Um, I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna become an evangelist about. But it's just one thing. Those are little things that you just think about from time to time and make make positive decisions around it. Wow. No, I asked you. Um, I don't think I could fast. I think my um hangry levels would be out of control, and no one would want to talk to me. Um, but fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. And kombucha and the fermented stuff is really interesting as well. And that's an easy one. But if you don't make it, which it sounds like you do. You can just go and buy it. Um, okay, my next rapid fire question for you. Are you ready? Yep, let's do it. What is just one thing that you would tell Fraser if you could go back in time? What would you tell young Fraser? Uh, I would um, oof, I would say um, pretty much I'm, I'm pretty happy with the, the, all of the, the mental work that I've done. So, But I would hmm. just say um, uh, keep, develop, keep developing whether it's study, whether it's stuff around your mental health, whether it's, you know, all those sorts of things, just keep learning, being inquisitive and learn. Great one. I'm hoping you've got a bucket list or semi bucket list. And I want to know what's one thing that you're yet to tick off that's on there. Um, so some of the things on my bucket list have, have evolved around lifestyle. So, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the work that I'm doing is evolved to be online. 
uh, and so therefore I can work anywhere in the world. So one of the things I'd like to do over my career is to be able to, you know, go to Spain for a month and, and still work and, and get to know a small country town um, and, you know, spend a bit of quality time and get to know locals. Um, so whether that's uh, Spain or whether it's someplace in, you know, South America or whether it's Canada or whether it's, you know, somewhere in uh, some other part of the world, it's just about um, traveling and, and being able to work from anywhere. Amazing, amazing, amazing. I look forward to knowing when you're going because we've got to do the things. Yep, absolutely. And then my last rapid fire question to you is, do you have a book that I can put on my hit list to read as part of my fake book club? Oh, I've started a fake book club, which is basically people just tell me what to read and then I'll just go away and attempt to read it. I'm a ferocious reader, as I've been told. And I've got a pretty long list, but yeah, what's one book you'd tell me to add? Yeah, so uh, so there's probably lots here, but uh, I'm I'm not a ferocious reader, but I I love listening to the audio books. Mm-hmm. So um, okay. to me, probably the one I mean, there's a few I really enjoy. Um, the Infinite Game by Simon Sinek is a really mm-hmm. really cool one. That's um, it's all around leadership and 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 understanding the. It's both about business um, as well as personal um, a way of living and, and flexibility. Um, from a business point of view, I like things like the Story Brand by Donald Miller, um, or any any sort of marketing books uh, by Seth Godin. <laughs> so yeah, okay. I, I would say if it, if it was one, it would be The Infinite Game. Thank you. I'm adding that to the list. Um, I saw a purple cow skip the other day, and I thought <laughs> I thought that person's read Simon Sinek's book, and just thought, you know what, I'm making a skip business out of that, which I found hilarious. Yeah. Um, Just sort of rounding out today's conversation, I want to say on behalf of the community um, who listen to your Thursday slots, a giant thank you uh, for all of the insights that you have poured into our ears and therefore our brains and no doubt has created capacity and change and insight and innovation in people's businesses. Glenn, my business partner, gets uh, very grumpy and sort of is hesitant for me to listen to your podcasts regularly because I come out with 7,000 things that I want to change and he's like, add it to the list. I'm like, no, I don't want to add it to this. I want to just do it, uh, which poor man has to then cope with. But I do want to say a giant thank you. We're very excited for you to be rolling out sort of your special edition, special features component of XY where you get really deep and niche on a broad range of topics depending on sort of what comes up. No doubt you're going to be an amazing investigative podcaster. And I want to say thank you from me personally for being my first podcast guest. Oh, you're very welcome. You. It was an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Jess.